Hello, uh, my name is Nicholas Holzberg and I'm speaking to you from Dubai, where I live. Uh, I'm the author of New Oxford Modern English and Oxford Primary Science for Pakistan and Oxford Social Studies for Pakistan and a number of other books, including smart and craft books, which are used widely in Pakistan. Uh, I've had a long association with Pakistan since 1989, when I started writing for Oxford University Press. So today uh, I'm going to be talking to you about collaborative learning strategies. The three key words, collaborate, connect and create. I will be speaking about what these words mean to me and how you can get these words working for you as teachers in your classroom. First of all, I'd like you to imagine yourself as a gardener, not as a teacher, a gardener. Yes, a gardener. You're looking after a garden and you've got plants and that your detail or your instructions are to look after that garden and look after all the plants. So what do you give your garden? What do you give the plants? Do you give the plants water because they need it to sustain themselves? Do you give them lots of sunshine because they need sunshine to be able to grow properly? Do you afford them fresh air so you make sure that they have fresh air and they're outside? And you give them some good soil in which to grow? And you, as the gardener, have to dig move the soil about. Sometimes you've got to add a little bit of manure, organic manure. And uh, basically you have to care for all of them if you want them to flourish. Now, if you give them some loving care, they will flourish even better. When you see some leaves and the leaves on a plant have got some dust on them, uh, or there are some insects on them, you flick those insects away and you clean the leaf so that air can get in and the, the leaves can breathe and grow properly. Into the strong plants, of course, will survive. The weaker ones will wither. So if you only look after the strong plants because they start producing flowers and they start producing fruits and they look lovely and they're colourful, and you work with them and you nurture them properly and you water them really well and you dig the soil around them and you just look after those ones that are flourishing and you leave the weaker ones alone, the weaker ones will gradually wither and die. So your job as a gardener is to look after all the plants in the garden. And now we will come to your job as a teacher and how you can use this idea in your classroom. So now we're in the classroom garden and you have, you have now shed your, your role as gardener. Bearing that in mind, what a gardener had to do in the garden to produce all these lovely plants and to look after the whole garden, not just a few of the good ones. So now you're in your classroom garden how do you look after the plants which have suddenly become the children in your class? So, first of all, if you want them to survive, all of them, and if you want them to flourish, and you want them to grow into beautiful, lovely human beings, doing good around the world, you have to give them lots of love. There's no point in you being in the classroom if you go back to the staff room and complain about this child and complain about that child and clutch your head and say, oh my goodness, what a headache. Oh, I've got to be in that classroom again on Monday. When is Friday coming along so I can go home and rest and be away from them? If that is your attitude, then you should change your job and do something else. You have to be in the classroom because you love children. That's number one. Number two, You've got to show them some affection. You can't be stern all the time. You can't be holding yourself back. You can't be, you can't have a role that you think is going to instill discipline in them. 
you have to show them some affection. And in that way, they will show you affection and they will come to your side. We'll come on to that in a minute. You have to show them some understanding because they're only little people. They have ways of thinking. You've forgotten those ways of thinking because you've become an adult. So you've got to remember how it was when you were a child, how you related to adults. Which of the adults that you related to best? What were the characteristics of those adults that drew you to them? And what are the characteristics of those adults that put you off getting close to them? So you've got to understand children and understand the way they operate and they think and show them a lot of, give them a lot of leeway. They do, they, they get angry. They do things that, that, that uh, annoy you and annoy other people. But you have to have patience. You have to have understanding. Patience, very important in a classroom. So some children learn very quickly. Some children learn very slowly. Some are very attractive and are forthcoming and are bubbly and are full of life and smile all the time. So they become attractive people. And some are not like that. Maybe their home background is different. Maybe they've had some kind of tra trauma in their lives. Maybe they just are quiet people who hold themselves back and don't give so much. But you as the gardener, you as the teacher, have to draw this out. You have to notice this. You have to understand this. You have to give them that love. And then with patience and with perseverance, drag it out of them. Make them grow, make them flourish, make them grow into wonderful people. That's your job as a teacher. So you have to also give them encouragement, lots and lots of encouragement. So in a classroom, we've got to eliminate fear. In an atmosphere where there's fear, where the children are fearful of coming to school, where the children are fearful of sitting in your classroom, where the children are fearful of you as a person, they hide things from you. They will not show you their true emotions. They will tell, begin to tell lies. They will hold things back. They will hide. So there should be no fear. And when there's no fear, they can come to you and speak from the heart and tell you what they really feel. Another thing that children like is enjoyment. So you ask yourself, when they come to class, are they happy? Are they enjoying themselves? If you give them the option, do you want to be in the classroom or do you want to go outside? Do you want to go home? Do you want to go anywhere else in the world? What do you think they'll say? The latter, obviously. Anywhere but in the classroom. So if you make your classroom full of atmosphere and a nice place and there's some enjoyment going on there and they know that they are going to have a good time, they will be there with you and together you can get about doing your textbooks, learning, because you know what they have to learn, you know the syllabus and so on. So your, your job is to encourage them, to create this enjoyment for them, so that they will learn. Your classroom should also be a place of peace. So when you say we will have some quiet, then it should be a quiet place. When you say, come on, we're all going to dance and sing and we're going to shout and we're going to make a, we're going to have fun and activity, then that's the time for that. So fun, you must have fun. You must have enjoyment, you must have peace at certain times, and you must have no fear. Activity, children are born to run around, shout, be boisterous, uh, make a noise, get into things, investigate, tear things apart and so on. Yes, we have to control that a little bit, but they need activity. If you're going to make them sit in a chair or on a bench all day long in front of a desk, they are going to get utterly bored and their little limbs are going to be, this is why you will get children who in class start fidgeting. And if they don't fidget and make movements themselves, they will start fidgeting and pinching the person next door and doing naughty things and getting up to naughtiness when they should be active. 
So every now and again, you have to have activities in the classroom, whether it's English or whether it's maths or whether it's whatever subject you're doing, you have got to get them active because children are active. And another thing is comradeship. You have to be their friend. You have to be their mentor. And you have to also get them to be friends with each other, stopping fights and so on. Now, what is it that children like? Children like playing. Do they get this opportunity in the classroom? You have to create that opportunity time and time again so that they can play. They love playing. So through play, you can get them to learn. You're not wasting your time. You're involving them and they will start learning. Activity. I mentioned this already. Children love singing. They love singing and we never sing in class. So when we do sing, it's a very formal, dirge-like, monotonous, da 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 and it becomes boring. And they repeat the words because that's what they're supposed to be doing. They shout because that's what they're supposed to be doing, making a loud noise, but they're not singing, they're not listening. So in English especially, you must sing lots of songs. Turn everything into a song. Turn all your lessons into a song. Make songs out of them. Ask the children to create songs out of them and sing. Um, another thing children love doing is acting. So get them acting. Every chapter in your book, every lesson in your book has some scope for acting. Whether it's a dialogue between two people whether it's the narration of a story or a poem, it involves expression, it involves acting. So if you're going to read something from the text, or if they are going to read something from the text, understanding comes so much more easily if you pronounce everything as it should be pronounced. When somebody shouts, shout! When somebody is singing, ah, la, 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 sing! When somebody is dancing, dance in the stories. You have to do all these actions. You have to, you have to be that person who motivates the children without any fear, without any holding back. You have to be absolutely open-hearted with them and they will respond and they will start learning much better. Language is not just about learning words and the meaning and, and changing sentences from the present to the past and doing the grammar and you know it's about expression you have to try at the very start to get them to be creative we'll come to that a little bit later so acting is very important the pronunciation becomes much better uh, the, the understanding of each word because of the way if you say swirling and moving and running and jumping and each of these words has a different connotation. They could be similar, but they all are used in different contexts. And the meaning becomes clear if you enunciate it, if you pronounce it, if you express it in the correct way. Another important thing that we lack and we don't do in class, and especially in, in my English stories that I put into my books, there is always a lot of humour. The humour sometimes is hidden and you have to find it. But if you look, you can find it and it is funny. And when it is funny, do laugh because it's there to make you laugh. It's there to make the children laugh. They love laughing. They love jokes. Um, if you ask children what stories they like, they like the happy, jolly stories where funny things happen and they giggle and they laugh at all the little jokes. And if in class, you say, no laughing, no giggling. Learning is a serious matter. It defeats the purpose. You're not going to get them on your side. You're not going to get them to collaborate in any way. So, but you think exams are important? You think the textbook and learning the textbook is important? You think the routine is important? You think the timetable is important? You think the syllabus is important? 
And all these things are important. But if you bear these things in mind, you don't have to put it onto the the onus onto the children. For example, in my books, when I started writing, I would write a story and I would have some questions and, and so on. And then teachers started saying, no, we need some more analysis, so you've got to have some more grammar in it. Then they started saying, what about vocabulary? You must have a glossary. So put in all the difficult words. But how many words are difficult? You choose the difficult words. And to one child, there'll be eight difficult words that he won't understand or she won't understand. And to another child, there will be three words that he or she doesn't understand. So what do we do? Should we put in the eight and waste space when we could have a lovely drawing there? Or should we have three and uh, have a, lot, a bit more space? Either way, we're going to lose out somewhere. So what's wrong with you creating your own glossaries for each lesson? Each child produces a glossary that is suitable to that child, not to the teacher, not to the textbook, not to the exam, but that child. So I want to learn, or I don't know five words, I write those five words down. Another child doesn't know ten words, well, poor chap or poor girl, she's got to write the meanings for ten words in her little glossary book. So anyway, we are, we are into this because we, we have to put in a glossary and we have to do this to, to, to please a certain number of uh, teachers. If there is time and if you get the children to write their own glossaries, they will learn the words and they will learn the meanings of those words far more readily, far more easily than if I put into a book five words and say, learn these, or you ask them, learn this, learn this, learn this, learn this, regardless of whether they know the words or not. Using the words, using them with expression, that's how you learn the language. So you have to be clever, you have to bear in mind all these things about exams, textbooks, routine, you know, timetable, keeping the noise level down, don't upset the headmistress and so on. Uh, with the syllabus, are we completing the work in time? But I can assure you that if you employ some of these means, that is, you create this atmosphere in your classroom, you will get through a lot, of, a lot more work in the year and you will be that gardener. You will not leave the weak ones behind. Let the let the plants, let the, the, the kids with the with the uh, the brilliance, let them survive on their own. Let them work with the other children. Let them carry on on their own. They will learn without you, without your intervention, without you holding them up and slowing them down. And you can spend more time with the ones that are withering, the ones that are falling behind, the ones that are dying. Work with them. Because ultimately Everybody has to be a member of society. And if you leave some behind and you say, excuse me, I can't, I can't nurture you anymore. I can't teach you anymore. You go to somebody else's classroom or better still leave the school and leave us that headache that you are causing us. Um, that's not what it's all about. Education should be for everybody and you should give your time equally to everybody. And if those people don't require your time, allow them to continue learning and give your time to the ones who are weaker. So let's now go on to how you can collaborate and how you can connect and how you can introduce creativity. Now let's get on to the three key words, collaboration, connect, create. So collaboration, uh, there are two aspects to this come to my mind. One is the collaboration between the teacher and the pupil and the second is the collaboration between pupils themselves. So how do they collaborate with each other? So let's look first at the collaboration that might occur between the teacher and the pupils. And remember what I said about the garden. So before the textbook 
before you get into the textbook and how you can deal with a particular chapter in the textbook and the exercises and so on, uh, how does one start collaborating? Before you open a textbook, and you have read, presumably, the text, and you know what is coming in the lesson, and you know what the, the, the exercises are, are all about, you can seek the ideas and participation of the children in everything, in everything you do in the classroom. Ask them, ask them for an opinion, even if you know that what they are going to say is quite different to what you think they should be doing or should be saying or should be spending their time doing. Um, ask for their opinion, because giving an opinion, when I go to schools in Pakistan and I I walk into a classroom and I'm introduced and uh, there's all these bright, lovely, beautiful children sitting there and I start interacting with them, I ask them questions because without me asking them a question, I, I, I can't proceed. I can go there and tell them all about myself and say, ah, 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 I'm this and I'm that. And they will sit and they will either listen or they will understand or they don't understand. But I'm not communicating with them. I'm, not, I'm just dictating to them. I'm talking all the time to them and not listening to them. So I ask questions. And if you ask anybody a question, Nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, unless there's a cheeky, one cheeky little kid in the classroom, and that cheeky little child, and you soon, I soon know who that cheeky little child is, who doesn't care for what the teacher thinks and so on, and all the staff think that that child is a cheeky little person, that's the only one who will reply. Whereas if you ask anybody else a question, and you say, okay, so tell me, do you like social studies? Silence. They are fearful of expressing an opinion, especially with adults around. And then the adults behind me, or the teacher behind me, or the headmistress, or the headmaster, or whoever, will begin to prompt the children. Oh, tell him, go on, go on, tell him. No, no, no. you can be, you can be. <laughs> you can be truthful and the child is thinking you've got to be kidding me I'm not going to be truthful <laughs> I, I absolutely hate the subject I abhor the subject do you think they're going to tell me that <laughs> with with adults standing behind me going, <laughs> no way so, so when I go in so why, why, why is this? One, there's a fear. Two, perhaps they don't know how to answer because nobody has ever asked them a question for an opinion. Yes, if I ask you which is the tallest mountain in the world or which is the longest river or who, what is the capital of uh, Germany or whatever it is, yes, you can give me an answer if you know. If you've mugged up the textbook, you can give me an answer. But if it's a question which requires giving your opinion, your feeling, very seldom will children tell you what they really think. They will tell you what you want them to think, or what you they would like to be, you would, or what you have already told them, what you, they know your stance, they know your opinion, and so they will give you back what you have given them. But you're not going to get anywhere if this is the case in education. You want them to think for you, themselves, you want them to have ideas of their own, and through those ideas, draw them in for this participation. So collaboration is not just a one-way uh, affair. It is something that happens between people, with, between two groups. So don't dictate to them all the time. Discuss things. If you are talking all the time and you are telling them how to think, they will only think like you, and with your prejudices, with your shortcomings, with your uh, animosities, with your anger, with all of the things that make you a person, they will only get what you have, and they will not become human beings in their own right. So discuss, don't dictate, and don't dismiss their contributions. Children have ideas, they will express them in children's ways, 
um, encourage them when they make mistakes. It doesn't matter. As long as they've started to express themselves, those mistakes will be ironed out. If those mistakes exist anyway, in language I'm talking about, if those mistakes are going to be repeated again and again and again, and there's fear of punishment, of uh, being reprimanded, of making a mistake, then they will not speak, they will hold it back. Because it's better to be silent in their reckoning than to come out with something and make that mistake again. So they won't speak. So what you're really doing is you're making these people revert to within themselves and not come out of themselves as you should be doing like in that garden making them flower and making them flourish so don't miss dismiss any of their contributions and don't also make anybody like stand up and be ashamed or shame them that is not the way to encourage them to learn anything get them on your side and get on their side too. So you have to, you have to be, you have, this is a collaboration. You become a pupil with them. There's, there are many, many, many things you do not know. And there are many, 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 many things that I do not know. So I'm not talking from a point of view that I know everything. And nor should you be talking in class as if you know everything. Because the children know that you don't know everything. There are many things you don't know. So. And there are many more things that the children don't know. So you get on their side, you become a pupil with them. But at the back of all this, you be aware of who you are. You be aware that you are in charge. So you can't let things get out of hand. But you want to create this lovely atmosphere where there's no fear and where they can express themselves. And in this way, they will all participate. You notice that sometimes in your classroom there are some people, there are some children who will always participate, who will always come forward. Those are the ones you give the jobs to. You make them the prefect, you make them the class monitor. You say, here's the stick, I'm going out for 10 minutes. You say, yeah, you clean the blackboard here or the whiteboard or whatever it is. You take these books and you go give them to the headmistress. You never give the weaker ones these jobs because why? Soon they realize that A, you don't trust them. You don't expect them to do anything. They are not expected to perform to any level. You have already given up on them. They will give up on themselves. So you've got to make everybody feel that they can contribute to this. And that is what collaboration is all about. Don't scold them and make them feel bad. And you relax, relax. Now we've talked about uh, collaboration between teacher and pupils and how to maybe improve the situation in your classrooms. And mark my words, it will improve if you try this. Uh, what about collaboration between pupils? Because there's lots of, lots of uh, emphasis these days on doing project work and working you know, with each other and so on. So how do we get this to flourish in our classrooms? much of what we do in our classrooms is anti-collaborative anti-collaborative we don't allow children we do on the surface we might say okay you work together in this group you make something for the board here do this for the display get together and write this and we want you to learn this song together and you sing it but most of the uh, jobs or most of the activities in class are anti-collaborative. We segregate them, we separate them, we encourage selfishness. They know you do it. See, here's a good person, he's done it on his own, now you go off and you do this on your own and don't share. So we need participation, we need pupils to get together, allow them to share, allow them to copy. Why do we not allow children to copy from each other? If you think about it, and you've got some children sitting and you say, all right, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to give you a spelling test and you start dictating and you give them a difficult word and you see one child is sitting there writing and she or he is looking over to the next to see what they've written. And you say immediately, stop writing. No, you write your own. Why is that child doing that? 
And child is doing that because that child doesn't know how to spell the word. <laughs> so the child has to learn to spell the word. Not, not try and copy deviously, because at some stage they will say, well, you can give me the word. No, no, no. Or, or, we don't allow them to <laughs> share. We don't allow them to copy. But they, why they copy is because they don't know. And you're saying you don't know, so don't, don't, we're not going to, we're not going to teach you now. I'm not going to tell you anymore. I've told you once. And uh, you can't copy from that person. So what happens? The child ends up not knowing those words. And the, the whole purpose of the exercise is to learn those words. Not get 9 out of 10 or 7 out of 10 or whatever. The marking is not important. The learning of those words is important. So if it means doing it again, if it means copying and learning, copy and learn. So and you get children, you get the, the ones who know, you get them to help the weaker ones. And in this way, everybody is sharing, everybody is cooperating, everybody is collaborating. Allow them to help each other. Allow the good ones to help the weaker ones. And uh, not, 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 not making it a point that this one is bright and this one is stupid, so you two can come together and hopefully some of this will rub off on this. No. It's, at times, this person should be given that opportunity to help somebody else who's even weaker. And look at the pride, look at the the um, happiness, look at the joy that will be in that child that I have been asked to help somebody. I am the fool in this class because my teacher has told me I'm the fool. I get the lowest marks and now somebody suddenly is asking me to help somebody else. Oh, what a fantastic feeling for that child. What a boost to that child. So do this, do this as often as you can. Um, and it's through sharing that this work and projects can get done. In life, when they go and they work in an office somewhere, they have to share. They have to get on with other people. They have to, they have to collaborate. So all this thing has to happen in the workplace. Why can't it happen in the classroom? So you must create the opportunities for this to happen. And the idea is, of course, to get them all to know about something, not just some of them very quickly. If, if you put 10 adults in a room and you ask them to learn about something, you'll find that some do it in five minutes and some take an hour and they still can't understand what's happening. The same with children. So we've got to help those who are slower. We've got to help those who can't grasp things so quickly to grasp whatever we are going to teach them. That's what education is all about learning, not being punished for what you don't know. Okay, let's look a little bit more now about uh, what they can do for collaboration in the textbook. Um, you, when you have looked at a particular chapter in the textbook, you can work out project work. It's very easy to work out project work. Quite often, one of the last exercises in the in the uh, book will, I mean, in the exercises, will get the children to work in a group um, to produce something. So you can devise your own project work. Um, drama. Every English lesson, whether it's a poem or whether it's a story, has drama in it. I said earlier on, you have dialogue. And dialogue is drama. You can get children to come up and enact anything that is going on in the uh, the story or uh, whatever it is, whether even if it's a report on something um, about snakes or about uh, mountains or you know it's a it's it's not a, a fiction, but it's more of a documentary kind of thing. You can still do it, and you can get the children to have a mock-up of a, a TV studio or a radio interview uh, or some climber or so the person who'd kill the snake or whatever it is and get them to A, they're being active, B, they're using the vocabulary concerned with that particular chapter and they're beginning to understand it. So when it comes to reading the text, it's very simple. The people and teachers are very scared of doing things that are away from the textbook, outside the textbook, because they think they're wasting time. We won't finish the syllabus. We won't get to the end of the year and we've done nothing. 
But in understanding the textbook, if you spend more time with these sort of activities outside the text, the text then becomes easy. You can read it and it's, it's done in 10 minutes. If you spend time aware of the exercises or aware of the words or the structures or whatever it is that is being taught in that lesson, if you're aware of that and you make yourself aware of it, then uh, the actual text becomes very easy. So drama, speech is there in drama, expression, vocabulary, uh, and real understanding comes when you use these words with expression. Displays, make your classroom a very uh, atmospheric place, full of, for example, I'm speaking to you now and it's Halloween, and you go to some places and even in shops here and so on, are full of Halloween things. People don't even understand sometimes what Halloween is all about, and nor do I, but um, it, there are displays. And so people have gone to the effort of making skeletons hanging up and spooky masks and so on, um, and beautifying the place in a way. Um, so your classrooms should be the same. Whenever you are studying something, whether it's a poem or whatever it is, let's say you're studying a poem, and you get the children to do a drawing, their interpretation of what they think this is. All those drawings can go up. And the idea and the theme of the poem is going on in their heads while they're doing this. And all those pictures are up on the wall. So for a whole week, this, this atmosphere that you have created is there and the vocabulary is there in their heads or they're hearing it from other children and so on. So displays and making your classroom an exciting place, very important and an important collective activity for collaboration. Uh, creating a mural, for example. All the children can work on it together and they can create a mural uh, for the classroom. Poetry, you can encourage them to write their own and the stories, write their own. Coming on now, leading on to creativity and being creative. So, but this comes from collaboration, so collaborate. Most lessons in those textbooks, whether it's English, whether it's science, whether it's social studies, allow for collaborative exercises. I'd like to say a little bit about the second word in our three words, collaborate, connect, and create. Um, connect. Teacher connecting with children is the same really as collaborating with them, but you connect with them uh, if you want to. It depends. We connect with people in life or we don't connect with people in life. Um, you as a teacher should try very hard to connect with all your children on a personal level, on a day-to-day uh, -day level. Um, from a textbook point of view, you've got to connect to the outside world. The textbook is not and cannot be held in isolation. You can't, you can't work learning doesn't come from a textbook. It may be an impetus, it may be uh, where you start, it may be where you come back to for a summary, but it should not be the be-all and end-all of learning. So learning a textbook and just mugging up what is in the textbook is not education at all, it's not learning. You have got to be able to, as a teacher, well, but well, me as an author, I can only put in so much into a textbook. Say, for example, uh, there's a, an exercise I want to do on uh, singular and plural. So this is a bat and these are bats. This is a frock, these are frocks. This is a banana, these are bananas, and so on. On a page, I can put in six pictures. Bananas, bat, frock, frog, table, chair. It doesn't mean that these words are the most important words in the English language to make plurals out of. They're only six words. There are thousands of thousands and thousands of nouns, millions of nouns, that you can introduce. What's to stop you introducing those to teach plurals? We can only spend that much time, one page, to introduce six, seven objects. But that's nothing to stop you 
from introducing 150 and getting the contribution of the children to suggest words, getting the children to collaborate and produce pictures so that you can put them up on the board and this, the, the purpose is to teach them what is singular and what is plural. Do not learn the spelling of those six words and learn what exactly the plural of bat is and the plural of frock is. That's not important. They have to get the idea that most of them are an S added to the end or an ES added to the end. And when somebody uh, suggests a, a word that has uh, match, this is a match. And these are matches. So we've got an ES here. Ah, that's odd. But those are the words that because they've, you have asked them to draw or, or put up on the board, have a display, that then becomes easy for them to understand. So connecting to the outside world, the world of ideas, the world of exercise in the textbook should lead you away from the textbook to things outside. There's a lot of language and ideas beyond the textbook um, and you have an ample scope to do this. Now, the last of the three words possibly the most important of the three words. I think the other two relate to processes and what you can do to make your classrooms more lively and, and uh, bring about some understanding. But we can't teach uh, creativity. We can allow it to happen and we can give exercises to enable it to occur. But we can't say this is what you do. If you want to be creative, this is how you do it. Um, to create something, we require thought, first of all. And I've given you examples uh, earlier on about when you ask a child a question for an opinion, they can't give you their opinion because they're too scared or because they don't have one. I'd like to think it's because they're too scared and not because they don't have one. They do have them. You have to draw it out of them. Um, but we, we tend to do this in education. We tend to dull them as they get older and older and older. They get close and close and close and, and it closes up in the end uh, they don't want to give you an opinion so to create something we require skill we need imagination now what's imagination you can't again teach somebody to imagine unless you're given them these exercises or think of your own story create your own uh, poem uh, draw you draw don't copy I go to some schools and I see they, they've created, uh, they say this is, oh look, they, the children have done this artwork. And you see 46 apples and they're all done in the same way. You see 46 buildings and they're all the same. They're all, they're all copied. I mean, it's exactly the same. What the colors you put in are slightly different, but there's no imagination. There's no creativity. That is not being creative. That is learning how to be a parrot learning how to copy something. So we need to have the skill, physical skill and so on, uh, and you need to have imagination. And to create something, we need to be able to think outside the box. So you can't be creative if I'm aping or if I'm parroting the views of the teacher. If I'm parroting what the book tells me all the time, I cannot be creative. You have to think outside the box. So nothing new or innovative can come from rote learning of information from textbooks. You can pass examinations, you can get high flying marks, and if you can't give an opinion, if you can't give your idea of how to do something new, uh, what would your idea be? If you say, for example, we need to stop water flowing from here to there, uh, how can we do it? Oh, the textbook says build a dam, so everybody wants to build a dam. And nobody will say, well, if we plant more trees, perhaps it will change, uh, you know, the water will be absorbed. And if we have less building, perhaps it will flow better. Perhaps we can divert it. Perhaps we can build canals. And these new ideas will never come out. If the textbook says, how do you do it? How do you stop this water? Put a dam in there. So you need to be free or you need to allow them to be free to express an opinion. And uh, 
once they have started on this process of being creative, that is, you have given them the opportunity, then you have done a great job. It will take wing. The Clothes Line by Charlotte Druitt Cole Hand in hand they dance in a row, Hither and thither and to and fro, Flip, flap, flop, and away they go, Fluttering creatures as white as snow. Like restive horses they caper and prance, Like fairy tale witches they wildly dance, Rounded in front but hollow behind, They shiver and skip, in the merry march wind. One I saw dancing excitedly, struggling so wildly till she was free. Then, leaving pegs and clothesline behind her, she flew like a bird and no one can find her. I saw her gleam like a sail in the sun, flipping and flapping and flopping for fun. Nobody knows where she now can be hid in a ditch or drowned in the sea. She was my handkerchief not long ago, but she'll never come back to my pocket, I know. The Flying Machine, Part Two Wait a minute, said Sammy. His uncle looked round. Behind the glider were ten boys, all friends of Sammy's. Sammy raised his right hand. Then he shouted, Now, come on, boys, all together, push! And the boys all pushed, and before Uncle Salim knew what was happening, the glider had been hurled over the rock and had started to fall at great speed towards the fields below. Uncle Salim let out a shriek and pulled the rod towards him. The glider straightened up, and in a second a strong gust of wind caught hold of it, and it flew up into the air. Hurrah! shouted Sammy and the boys. Well done! shouted all the people, looking on. Uncle Salim did not shout. His face was white with fear. The glider was going higher and higher, and below him he could see the town and the river and the road curving away towards the city. He pushed a loop of string down, and the glider started to turn. He pushed the other loop down, and it started to turn the other way. These strings work well, said Uncle Salim out loud, and I'm becoming quite a good pilot. Uncle Salim pushed down his left foot again, but nothing happened. He looked down and noticed that the string had broken. Oh, my goodness, he said to himself, now what shall I do? The glider was rushing along at a great speed. Ahead of him, hundreds of feet below, he could see the first houses of the city. The glider rushed on and on. I wonder if I can mend that string, said Uncle Salim to himself. He leant over and tried to catch the end of the string, but suddenly the whole glider tilted over on its side. Uncle Salim fell off his seat and just managed to catch on to it with one hand. He shrieked aloud, Help! Help! But there was nobody to help him. Slowly and painfully, Uncle Salim pulled himself up towards the machine. When he looked down, he found that the weight of his body had pulled the machine forward, and it was now heading towards the ground. Uncle Salim caught hold of the bamboo stick, but the glider started to go round and round in circles, getting lower and lower. Oh dear, shrieked Uncle Salim, what will happen to me now? Down it went, and Uncle Salim looked below him. He could see a huge lake. The glider was still going round in circles, lower and lower and lower, when suddenly, crash! The glider hit a tree, and Uncle Salim shot high into the air like a bullet from a gun. He landed with a tremendous splash in the lake. Luckily, he could swim, and he managed to reach the bank. Later that night, Sammy and his parents waited in the house for news of Uncle Salim. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. 
Sammy got up slowly and went to open it. There was Uncle Salim standing on the doorstep and smiling. Uncle Salim, he shouted. His mother and father came running out. You're safe, they cried. Yes, said Uncle Salim, but only just. And I shall never go in another flying machine for the rest of my life.